Hello, everybody. We are going to pick up where we left off. Um, if you remember before, um, we learned a lot about Millie May and how she's kind of the town gossip, um, spreads information around everybody everywhere. Um, and um, we were about to find out how Piper was going to um, prove everybody wrong and, um, and prove Millie May wrong, that um, she wasn't wrong in the head like it had said. Um, like Millie May, Millie May Miller had said. So let's see what happens next. Alas, despite Piper's Herculean efforts, late afternoon arrived to find Millie May no closer to eating her words and Piper no nearer to securing a friend. Bobo and Candy Sue, the sun-kissed Hassifer twins, initially took a shine to Piper, but her funny ideas became a distraction from their unabated chatter about and flirtation with the many strapping young farm boys who caught their eye. When Piper was unwilling to join them on a trek to the nearby bushes along the, with the sweaty, stubborn brothers, she was quickly discarded. If Piper had been able to overlook the fact that Jesse Jean Jenkins' chief pleasure was stripping the wings off of struggling flies and then feeding them to her pet spider, Beezlebub, she might have taken Jesse Jean up on the offer of pricking their fingers and becoming blood sisters. Sadly for Jesse Jean, Piper could not. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Didn't realize that she, she was ignited. She started talking to me. Sadly for Jesse Jean, Piper could not. Then, of course, a lot of other kids re recognized Piper's face from church. Despite the fact that they'd never said more than one word to her, or she to them, Piper's reputation, courtesy of Millie Mae Miller, had preceded her, and not a single Christian soul among them was willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. While unwilling to admit defeat, Piper realized that things were definitely not going the way she had planned, which was precisely when a baseball game was called to order, providing Piper with a perfect public opportunity to redeem herself and show her true worth. Gathering in the open field next to the picnic, along with other small fry of Lowland County, Piper watched with fascination as pushing and pulling and shouting kids chaotically organized themselves into teams. Junie Jane, a tough girl who'd whack any kid who called her a girl, quickly declared herself the captain of one team, while Rory Ray took the other. The selection process promptly followed. Billy Bob, Rory Ray called out. Billy Bob, a strapping boy, who could slug the ball to the moon, lumbered out of the waiting group and took his place behind Rory Ray. The other children jostled to be noticed. Piper among them. Piggy Poo, Junie Jane called out. Lizzie Lee, Rory Ray countered. Sally Sue, Junie Jane returned. I'm noticing everybody's names are uh, alliterations. Do you guys know what alliterations are? If not, look it up. But we're also going to be learning about it later in the year. With a sinking heart, Piper watched as one by one, everyone else was chosen until she and Timmy Todd remained. Timmy Todd had just turned six and was small for his age. He also had a nasty reputation among the other children for picking his nose and eating it, not to mention the fact that he bathed no more than once a week. Standing next to Timmy Todd, Piper felt humiliated. Then, as though that were not enough, Rory Ray agonized, choosing between the two of them. Oh, all righty, already. I'll take Timmy Todd. Rory Ray kicked to the dirt when he said it. Piper was officially the last to be chosen, and her mortification was complete. Or so she thought. I don't want to be her. I don't want her on my team. She's not right in the head, Junie Jane bickered, introducing Piper to the deepest riches of humiliation. If I'm stuck with that, Rory Ray balked, pointing at Timmy Todd, then you have to get stuck with her. Fair's fair. Ah, beans, Junie Jane spat, but Piper finally had a team. Bathed in the late afternoon sun, the whole community gathered on the side of the hill to watch the, with each other to watch the children's baseball efforts. Betty and Joe McLeod couldn't take their eyes off of Piper. They had seen her attempts to make a friend, and each time she was turned down, their hearts got a little heavier. Play ball, shouted Junie Jane, and the game began. Bam! Billy Bob hit the ball hard and straight for the outfield, 
straight for Piper. With her glove held high in the air, Piper reached up on her very, very tiptoes. She stretched as far as she could, careful not to let her feet leave the ground. Despite her every effort, the ball went right over her head and hit the grass ten feet behind her. She scrambled for it, but her feet clumsily caught on each other, and moments later, she was face down in the dirt. Ah, jeez, Junie Jane spat out her gum in disgust. Betty and Joe sighed, but Millie Mae Miller nodded at several ladies as though Piper's performance only confirmed her point. As bad as things seemed for Piper, they somehow managed to get even worse the more the game progressed. Facing Rory Ray, an ace pitcher known for a mean spitball, Piper held the baseball bat aloft, ready to do battle. Half the game was already over and her team needed this base. Their hopes weighed heavily upon Piper's ball-hitting abilities. Roy Ray wound up and threw the ball with all of his might. Piper gave it everything she had, and, You're out of here, Roy Ray called gleefully. A collection moan rose from her teammates. At the bottom of the ninth, with two bases loaded and two outs, Billy Bob covered the plate, confidently prepared to hit the home run that would win the game. Junie Jane, a fighter to the end, called a timeout and gathered Piper and Jimmy Joe to her side. Billy Bob's going to hit hard and far. McLeod, you're on the bench. You'll take McLeod's place on the field, Jimmy Joe. Junie Jane knew that Jimmy Joe could <laughs> could catch a fly in his bare hand on a moonless night. Besides, Piper hadn't caught or hit anything the whole game. Jimmy Joe reached for the glove in Piper's hand, but Piper held firmly to it. You can catch it, Junie Jane, she pleaded. You couldn't catch a cold if you lived in Antarctica without a winter coat. Could too, Piper was reduced to begging. Give me a chance, Junie Jane. I won't let you down. Cross my heart, stick a pin in my eye, and hope to die if I lie. Piper did as many of the arm motions as she could while holding the glove. Give me it, Jimmy Joe pulled roughly on the glove, but still Piper held firm. Junie Jane was not a soft girl. She didn't coo over puppies. She hated the color pink, and unlike every other girl in school, she had, hadn't once wished that Rory Ray would kiss her. In spite of herself, she suddenly felt empathy for Piper McLeod. Had things been different, if there hadn't been something wrong with Piper's head, Junie Jane probably would have gotten her a shot, given her a shot. As it was, Junie Jane wasn't going to blow the game for some idiot. Give it over, June Jane yanked the baseball glove out of Piper's hands so hard that Piper fell to the ground. You're on the bench, McLeod! Junie Jane yelled as she ran back to the pitcher's mound, her mind already on the next play. For the second time that day, Piper found herself in the dirt, her humiliation laid out for all of Lowland County to see. Millie Mae Miller was smiling in triumph while pretending to be sympathetic, which was not an easy expression to pull off. Kids were smirking in her direction. On the side of the hill, Piper saw Betty and Joe, and they looked like they'd been shot clean through the heart. Their features carried the unmistakable look of pity, which drove Piper to feel a deep shame of herself. Why she? Why hadn't she been able to catch or hit a ball? Why wasn't she able to make a friend? What a terrible thing it was to have your own mom and pa looking at you as though you were nothing, and Piper felt like nothing. Burning up, Piper dragged herself out of the dirt and walked away from the game and everyone there. She didn't know where she was going, and she didn't care if she'd ever got there. On the mound, Junie Jane spat on the ball, wound up, and sent it speeding toward Billy Bob. Billy Bob leaned into it, thrusting his huge shoulders forward. All the eyes in Lowland County rested on him, waiting and urging him on. Their breath stuck in their throats, and they couldn't move as the small white ball spun through the air toward the big boy holding an old wooden bat. Billy Bob swung hard, and crack! The bat splintered in half with the force of Billy Bob's swing. The ball exploded like a rocket into the air, but to the surprise of all gathered, particularly to Junie Jane, the ball didn't go into the right outfield and the waiting hands of Jimmy Joe as planned. Instead, Billy Bob proved he had more smarts than anyone, including his mama, gave him credit for, and sent that ball into the left outfield where Gomer Gunn was sleeping, was sleepily picking dirty wax out of his abnormally large ears. Parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and the minister, too, got to their feet and followed the ball with keen eyes as it rose higher and higher and then even higher into the air. 
Billy Bob caught a freight train to first base, which instantly ignited his team into unabashed jubilation while forcing the opposing players into fits of panic. Catch that ball, Gomer Gunn, Junie Jane hollered. Run, Billy Bob, the other team was shouting with all their might. Gomer Gunn shook himself into semi-consciousness and ambled his lanky frame into a position that might somehow catch the ball. Go, Gomer, go, Gomer, shouted his team. Several fathers whistled softly and shook their heads in wonder as the ball continued to climb in the sky. Underneath it, Gomer Glenn, Gomer Gunn futilely jumped into the air and swung his arm about like he was trying to catch cra- crab apples off a high branch. It was no use. That ball had grown wings and was reaching for loftier spheres. Gomer Gunn's arms came to a rest fruitlessly in his sides as he too stood as he too stood and watched the ball ascending to the celestial wet realm. Ah, Junie Jane spat. Doggone it all. She threw her glove down in a very unsportsmanlike way and muttered things that would have gotten her a hide tie a hide tanning had any parent been within earshot. As the ball sailed away, the entire team deflated and kicked the dirt or took off their ball caps and sighed deeply. Meanwhile, Roy Ray's team was ascending to a fever pitch of excitement as Billy Bob, now complacent with victory, began Sunday strolling the remaining bases. In the air, in the, in the stir of it all, Betty and Joe forgot Piper's retreating form. It was Betty who saw Piper pause as the ball headed her way, high in the air. It was Betty who saw Piper looking up at the ball with a curious intensity that immediately sent Betty to her feet. With eyes wide and hand reaching for her heart, Betty whispered, Dear Lord, no. Piper's entire body was tingling before she could even think straight. There wasn't a doubt in her mind what she was going to do. She was going to catch that ball and show them all. Let's see an idiot do this, you old bat, she thought at Millie May spitefully. Less than a, a second later, Piper's feet lifted off the ground and she launched upward into the air. Holy cow! Jimmy Joe stopped short. Look! He was the first, besides Betty and Joe, to see Piper flying. He watched her, rooted to the spot as the color drained from his face. Seeing his reaction, several kids turned to look, and soon expressions of bewildered wonder and confusion spread like wildfire across the field. Like an arrow shooting through the air, Piper chased after the ball. She made certain that she held her form, arms and legs straight and steady. She hadn't yet practiced retrieval techniques, and chasing a ball through the air is harder than it looks. Once she got her altitude right, she picked up velocity and sped after it. You can do it, she cheered herself along as she closed the gap. The tips of her fingers flirted with the leather of the ball. Lunging to snatch it, she missed, then wobbled dangerously on the verge of completely losing control. Adjusting her right arm, she held firm, got her legs back into position, and darted at the ball with all her might. With one final lunge, the spinning orb rested in her victorious hand. Piper immediately stopped in mid-flight and looked at the ball in shock. I did it, she whispered, glad and excited and thrilled all at the same time. Suddenly, Piper became so swept up in her victory that she shot up and performed a triple spiral backflip. When she was finished, she held the ball high above her head in a pose befitting a a pro baseball player in the throes of the World Series and yelled, Yippee! (laughs) The silence that followed her joyful shout was deafening. Even in the sky, Piper suddenly became aware that absolutely no one else was cheering or celebrating. Peering downward, the image of slack-jawed children and amazed farmers greeted her. Piper waited, but it never came. No one cheered. None of the kids asked her to play. Sally Sue did not run over and apologize or beg for friendship. Instead, parents' blank stares quickly turned to concern, and soon they were grabbing the hands of their children and walking, making that dashing away from Piper, as though she were a contagious disease. This is the work of the devil, one woman heard her to say darkly to another. Another farmer shook his head. She's given all them youngsters bad notions. When Piper's feet hit the ground, Betty and Joe snatched her away without a word. During the entire journey home, not a single syllable was uttered between all three of them. It wasn't until Piper had been placed in a kitchen chair back at the farm that Betty let loose her fury. 
What in the name of blazes was you doing, Piper McLeod? But Ma, I caught the ball. Piper held up the ball as evidence. Sometimes it seemed to Piper that her Ma and Pa missed the point entirely. When all was said and done, it had been a very hard, very confusing day all around for Piper. Nothing had gone as she'd hoped. And yet, despite everything, she had at last prevailed and achieved a certain victory by catching that ball. Surely she would be getting credit for that. Wasn't that what the game was all about and what everyone was cheering for? Didn't I do it? You was flying. I told you and told you. But Ma, you said there wasn't any use for flying. But see, there is. Piper held up a ball the second time because it was a fact. And I thought up more uses besides, like fixing the barn roof or Piper McLeod. But Ma, if you'd just try flying, I know you'd like it. And I could show you how. It's not difficult. And I already learned a bunch of hard lessons so you wouldn't have to get them so painful like I did. And there won't be any more flying around these parts. And I never want to talk about it or see you up in that sky again. And I mean it this time. Betty stamped her foot. Go to your room, Piper McLeod. We're going to pause there.